All right, everybody, welcome to the first lecture of the series. We're covering the phylum Anilidae. Uh, on screen here, you can see a site ID for lab practical aspects. Uh, for lab practical here, you should know the genus and species uh, that I have here, uh, Amanthus agrestis. Uh, this worm is not a native species to the United States or even to Tennessee. It's over from Asia. Uh, some common names there include Alabama jumper or the snake worm. Uh, the key feature there is this white band, this white clotillium here highlighted there. Uh, highlights this as well as, as you'll notice from this little video, uh, it's characteristic snake-like movement, especially yeah, when touch touched. Ooh. So hey, check touch it out. Make them hop. Do it again. Touch them. <laughs> Very stereotypical of the Alabama jumper. That you probably have seen that. If you've ever dug for a worm's around right here. So, not your stereotypical earthworm, Canadian nightcrawler. No, it's a worm. The Alabama jumper. Uh, so, like most invasive species, they do not have natural predators. Uh, and as you can see from the bottom of this picture here, on the left, before Alabama jumper, jumpers were introduced, notice the understory, how much undergrowth there is. After Alabama jumpers have taken a hold, look at the undergrowth, see how much uh, or lack thereof, really, uh, plants and other things there are. And so these guys here are... Uh, like I said, and not a native species. So moving forward here from the Alabama jumper, let's jump right into the phylum Anilidae. The segmented worms include earthworms and leeches. So again, we've noticed our phylogenetic tree that we've been working with for the last couple of weeks. And so looking here in the phylum Anilidae, key uh, synapomorphy being segmentation. So if you're filling out your hot sheets, which I have uploaded into Canvas there, as well as the notes and the answer keys, which will be uploaded later on. So um, all worms, all another day, all segmented worms have bilateral symmetry. They're triploblastic, meaning they have three germ layers there. Um, they have a coelom divided by a septa, just much like the septa in your nose. It's basically just a tissue that separates segment. This served as a hydrostatic skeleton. Uh, this skeleton provides the structure for the muscles to pull again. So think of like a water balloon. So when you squeeze the water balloon, how the gel or the water squeezes to one side or push to one side, this skeleton there helps allows the, um, the somites, the worm, to squeeze against that and to help move uh, in and around the dirt there. Uh, it has a very thin cuticle, which you'll see in a few slides, on the outside of the skin. So think about uh, worms on a hot summer day and what happens to them. Obviously, they dry out, but why do they dry out? Well, the reason that they dry out is because that the cuticle itself dried out and the worms couldn't breathe. So essentially, they die of suffocation. Um, the worms are much more advanced than the flatworms that we discovered uh, last week. They have true nervous tissues, excretory systems, circulatory systems for the first time that we've seen, uh, digestive, a full digestive system. The reproductive system is uh, kind of weird, which we'll talk a little bit about, as well as some muscular system here. They do have a closed circulatory system. Uh, they have a nerve cord and a brain. That runs throughout their entire bodies. They are hermaphrodites, which means again that they have both male and female sex organs uh, inside themselves. Of course, they being hermaphrodites, they can't self self fertilize, so don't expect uh, one worm to be able to have essentially sex with itself to create genetic new genetic variations. Uh, and then their uh, castings, there, very 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 good fertilizer, which is why you want to have. Uh, lots of good worms and things inside your flower bed. So basic worm anatomy here. So starting with the mouth. Uh, again, each individual segment. Again, while they're in the phylum Anilidae. Number three there, they kind of move around. is the clotillium, that band. And then 
the rest of the worm is kind of missing as it extends this way to the anus. And so the clotilium the, is uh, anterior to the hip. So the anterior, the clotilium, and then the rest of the worm would be the anus. So if you cut this worm in half, these worms cannot regenerate. So like I said, for fishing purposes, we use these a lot of times. We'll pinch one worm in half, right? And we'll come back a day, two, three days later, then the half worm is still alive. Uh, it's still alive, but it will not regenerate. This worm will not become too, like we saw in the flatworms, especially in the planarians. So, um, better slide here showing the internal anatomy of the annelidae. So, again, here's the clotilium. The cuticles out here. So, moving through the mouth, we have two little ganglia there that's going to function as a brain and a dorsal, excuse me, a ventral nerve core. So let me zoom out. Okay. A ventral nerve cord there. On the top side, we have a dorsal blood vessel connected by five, kind of one, two, three, four, five aortic arches. Uh, these aortic arches serve as hearts in a closed circulatory system. Uh, we Again, mouth, the pharynx, a very strong muscular se uh, section there, followed by the esophagus, which is underneath the hearts, interestingly enough. Uh, and then we'll get to a crop, gizzard, intestines. Now we have the excretory system. They have nephridia there. They're going to collect the uh, nitrogenous waste and liquid liquid waste there and actually going to excrete their, their liquid through their skin. So they're actually going to pee through their skin, which is kind of cool. So again, here is a uh, specimen here. Again, the white band there is the reddish band there is the clotilium. And each segment, segment there has a pair of uh, small pairs of bristles on the side called CD on the, so when we have the ventral side, the belly side, which is going to help you move. So again, the purpose of the circulatory system is to transport uh, nutrients, oxygen, as well as uh, broken down foods and metabol uh, for metabolism. So again, I like this point here. That it's a super highway, right, with the oxygen carrying the hemoglobin. So they do have blood. Their blood carrier molecule is just like humans with hemoglobin, iron in the middle, carrying four oxygens there. And then they'll be able to carry CO2 outside the cells. Uh, so again, they have two major blood vessels, which are responsible for taking blood to and from the heart there. The top is the dorsal. Uh, dorsal. The bottom is the ventral. If you dissect this worm, you will be able to see this. Uh, my recommendation is to start toward the anus with a pair of scissors and cut toward the mouth. That way, if you do happen to cut into the intestines, that you, toward the anus where it's not as many structures and things to see, that you're just kind of getting to like a muddy region as you clip the intestines. And then you come out and uh, start to cut, cut the cuticle. You'll see a cleaner and cleaner specimen as you work your way up. And when you do that, You'll be able to see a structure like this. So here's again the clotilium toward the mouth here. And we're going to be working with this image here quite often. Uh, so you can see the dorsal blood vessel right here as I'm drawing it with this red line there. So ignore the arrow for, for a moment. So continuing onward. Maybe. It does not like it after I have apparently written on it. Okay, so now we're looking at an artistic representation of the circulatory system. As you can see, here's the mouth. We have five aortic arches, so there are five little hearts. Again, dorsal, think of the dorsal fin of a shark or a dolphin that peeks out of the water. And then the ventral side being the belly with lots of capillaries networks surrounding the esophagus intestines uh, for the reason why we'll get into in a little bit. So again, this is a closed system, so they're just like us, so that there's no blood just sloshing around in like a cup, if you would take a cup of water and hit the bottom of it and the water would just kind of disperse. That'd be an open system, which we see in mollusk, but in annelidae, the segmented worms, it is closed. So because of this, the blood is moved through these special vessels to and back and forth. Um, 
So again, five of these hearts. So you want to remember that as we move forward. And here we go, a dissected specimen. Fairly decent here. I'll zoom in just briefly so you can see. One, two, three, four, and five. These gray looking structures there. All these rusty colors due to the hemoglobin in the system. And again, the pur purpose of the circulatory system is to pump blood. Uh, do worms have a pulse? Absolutely. And their pulse can change just like ours can change. Think about when your blood or when your body is frightened or scared. What happens to your pulse? Uh, why is that? What is happening in your body when the moment you get scared that it causes your or your pulse to change? Well, that would be the regulation system. So in this case, the endocrine system. So they are, they do make hormones and they are susceptible to hormonal regulation. Uh, also, the nervous system. So interesting fact there is that uh, patients who have received a heart transplant, their heart resting heartbeat is much higher, uh, about 20 beats or so than an average um, average person whose average heart rate is between 65 and 75, and a, a trans, heart transplant nervous system or heart regulates at about anywhere from 90 to 95 ish, maybe a little more depending on uh, cardiovascular strength, because of the loss of the input from the nervous system. So the nervous system is vital into controlling our heart rhythms as well as the endocrine system, the hormonal aspects of it. So both the nervous and the hormonal coordinate and help function uh, and maintain homeostasis. So the purpose of the nervous system again is to regulate the body's activities. Very, very, very quickly response in part because of the myelin sheaths uh, in the nervous system there increases the uh, rate at which the electronic signals can travel up to up to 100 times, which is just incredible. Again, we have two small Low brains, yes, they do have a brain, and those are fused directly to a nervous cord, again, which is located on the ventral side of the body. And I ask the question here is why would the nervous cord be on the ventral side of the body, unlike the back side of the body or the back, like they are in adults? What would be a benefit? Maybe a con. Think about it. So, all right, so on the ventral side, what you have is because of proximity and they crawl in their belly, the proximity of uh, local stimuli directly to the nervous system, allowing it to travel to the brain and initiate some type of response. So again, think about a worm on top of the on the ground, bird tries to pick at it, it runs over something, it can immediately feel that and respond. So very, very, very good. So looking here, the ventral nervous cord will blow it up just so we can see a little better here. One more time. So this white band right here, let's go back to the pen. This white band right here underneath the intestines is the ventral nervous system. So delete it here again so you can see. Perfect. And then again, the artistic representation here, we have the brain followed by a loop, which is interesting in itself, going through the pharynx and esophagus. And then they have individual ganglia that make up the nervous cord, just like ours, uh, our system is. It's incredible here. So again, chemical control is by the hormones from the endocrine glands. And then again, these purpose of the hormones, we won't get too in-depth today, is to regulate growth, reproduction, and then just general metabolism. Uh, gas exchange. So again, early on in the units, in the, in the year, we talked about respiratory system not being necessarily going to go breathing but the process of gas exchange so animals in this case here do breathe not necessarily by lungs but by exchanging oxygen and carbon dioxide in and out of the cells and so uh, we asked the question last week about diffusion how does oxygen and carbon dioxide know which way to go so again think about the process of diffusion from high concentration to low concentration, all right? So if I have, if I'm breathing out and I've used all my oxygen, oxygen is going to go inside the cell. When I breathe out, I have a high concentration of carbon dioxide inside my lungs, to less carbon, less concentration outside my lungs so that the carbon dioxide naturally wants to 
expel out of our lungs. So uh, the worm will use its moist skin from the cuticle there, that mucousy cuticle layer there on the outside, to help absorb and release carbon dioxide. So again, they do breathe directly through their skin, uh, which does have an impact on size and thickness of worms. So worms can't get too big because, again, think about the analogy that we talked about before where you have the 55-gallon barrel of Jello and you have a little uh, Jello shot of Jello. Which and I drop a drop a food color in it. Which one is going to hit the center first? Obviously, the little thin more jello shot is going to hit the uh, get the middle first because again, surface area to volume ratio. So again, worms can't be too thick in diameter uh, because again, carbon dioxide and oxygen would be unable to reach the interior of the cells. So again, this mucus there just helps maintain uh, oxygen levels as well as helps moisten it as it's crawling through the soil there. Again, here is a uh, great picture of the cuticle being lifted from a worm here. So we can see that fairly easy there. And again, it's just outer protect protective covering there, that mucousy slime layer. So again, just artistic representation, lots of capillaries right on the dorsal and the ventral side, following around the intestinal tract, the esophagus tract, and on the peripheral of the cuticle there. So oxygen can diffuse in when the concentration is low, and carbon dioxide can diffuse out when the concentration is very high inside the body. So excretion, we talked just a little, little bit before, liquid and gases are removed, and that is done uh, from organs known as nephridia. So in each segment is a nephridia, which is basically a rudimentary nephron, which is the fundamental unit for the kidney in our cells. And so what's going to happen is, again, carbon dioxide, each segment is going to collect nitrogenous waste from the blood supply, uh, as well, and these nephridia are going to release through these nidia pores, and again, it's going to essentially urinate through its skin, which is kind of cool. Pathway of digestion is huge in the earthworm, especially when we come time to about anatomy. Uh, so my recommendation is to learn the pathway of digestion, which I have down here, starting with the mouth, then the pharynx, the esophagus, crop, gizzard, intestine, and anus, respectively. Um, because when we start learning our anatomy, we learn the pathway of digestion. We've learned over half the anatomical parts required for this course. So again, the earth's worm's mouth is used for ingestion. Obviously, it's going to be eating the soil. And then the uh, enzymes and bacteria in its gut are going to be breaking down the, uh, the soil and any type of uh, animals that it may be eating in the process. So again, starting with the mouth here. And then the pharynx, the purpose of the pharynx is to is a temporary storage unit. So basically think of like your jaws, uh, your throat region and jaws and throat region there. It's called temporary storage of food. Follow that by the esophagus, which is going to help transport the food that we just eating through peristalsis. So smooth muscle contractions. We don't really have to think about that. It just goes down our throat, right? So there's the pharynx. When you start cutting it through this worm here, you're going to get want to stop about right in here because the pharynx is very, very muscular. Uh, just keep going there. You may get a little deep, and it's okay. Uh, but just keep cutting through, trying to get to the very tip of the mouth there. Okay. Uh, and then the esophagus is, again, shown here. We have see some similar receptacles and vesicles. Aortic arches are there, but the esophagus, remember, is underneath the aortic arches. Uh, next, we have the crop and a gizzard. So just like in birds, the crop is... Uh, essentially for a storage compartment for food and mixture. And then that's going to release into a gizzard, which is the mechanical grinding of the food. So again, the crop is to hold on to it. The gizzard's going to grind it up. And once the gizzard has grinded it up into uh, some type of chyme-like material, it's going to pass it into the intestines where more enzymes are going to be secreted and break down the food even more so into smaller and smaller components and be allowed to pass into the capillary system and throughout the body for the worm to use. So again, just artistic representation. It's a great shot here of uh, most of the pathway of digestion, starting with the mouth, 
then to the pharynx, then the esophagus, crop, gizzard, intestines, and then finally out the anus. So of the live worm here, we have the crop. Let's zoom in on this here. So again, the mouth, pharynx is this muscular structure here, esophagus underneath aortic arches and seminal receptacles and vesicles. And then finally right here with this forcep and red arrow is the crop. Follow that up with the gizzard. Okay, so the gizzard is much smaller than the crop. And it also feels a lot different, too. So if you were to take this probe or a, uh, a little pin and try to poke this, you'll notice that the crop is kind of very soft, while the gizzard has, again, much more muscle texture to it. So it has a little bit more uh, firmness as well. And then finally, we get to the intestines after the crop. Again, where all the nutrients are going to be absorbed, again, just like in our system, which is just remarkable to think about. Uh, so any undigested food, poop, food is pooped out, which is, uh, again, very, very common aspect of here. That's known as worm castings, and these are great, 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 great time for, for gardeners. Uh, lots of gardeners will do compost, uh, as well as buy red worms and other types of varieties of worms to help increase the amount of fertilizer and uh, uh, chambers in and around their plants. So again, just a, another view here of the internal anatomy of a worm. Because again, my recommendation when learning anatomy is to find something that you can always find and then either follow a system or follow some type of structure. So again, we'll follow the uh, pathway of digestion. We can always find the mouth, you know, opening of the worm there, mouth, pharynx, esophagus, underneath again, underneath the aortic arches, followed by the crop. Excuse me here while I fix this. Crop, gizzard, and then the intestines, right? Um, again, this diagram here shows the aortic arches, uh, which is nice. If I can move this down just a little bit, it's going to allow us to see the nervous cord. Uh, so, again, a very nice little artistic model of the worm. Now we get to some weird things in how worms reproduce. So, Remember that these worms are hermaphrodites, which means they're neither male or female, but they have both sex organs inside. So they do have testes and they have ovaries, uh, which kind of complicates things for worms. Uh, one of the things that you'll want to know uh, is, it's a great short answer type question, is how do worms reproduce? Earthworms, that is, or segmented worms. So again, these cannot self-fertilize for various reasons, like most hermaphrodites. Um, the eggs have some type of prezygotic barrier that will not allow uh, essentially genetically identical sperm to mate with its own eggs. So it has to find a mate. So how does a worm find a mate? What type of environmental cues can you think of that would allow worms to find each other? So pause the video here and think about this for a second before continuing on. So uh, if you guessed that the environmental cue is rain and warm weather, you're right. And so uh, when it rains and you see earthworms come to the top, a lot of people, around, especially around here, will say, oh, well, they're just trying to get out of the water. Well, it's not necessarily true. It's all about uh, essentially it's breeding time. And that environmental cue of moisture coming down allows them to go up find each other by releasing pheromones, and they find each other and they pair up. So when they pair up, some anatomy here is important to kind of realize. So the earthworm has, obviously it's got two pair of testes. They're located in sections of the somites 10 and 11. So if you start counting from the mouth and count the segments 10 or 11, you will find the testes there. A small tube then connects the testes and passes it down to section 14. So we're going closer to the uh, clotilium there. From there, we're going to find a pair of ovaries. Again, that's the female sex organs are located at 13 and released, and it's carried their eggs down to section 14. And so see, here we have just a worm here. So again, from the mouth, you were counting down the somites here around 10, 11 is the testes, 13 is the ovary, and then 14 is going to be the reproductive pore. Uh, and so, backtrack just slightly here. Here we have something called seminal vesicles, 
and seminal receptacles. Okay, so seminal vesicles are going to help nourish sperm. Seminal receptacles are going to receive sperm. Okay, so a little weird here. So when you dissect uh, a worm here, you'll see seminal vesicles. And then the smaller ones on the side here are seminal receptacles. So again, most of the worm there, these little white storage compartments here are actually nourishing uh, sperm for reproduction. And then these little bitty white glands here are going to receive any sperm uh, receive any sperm receive any sperm given to it during uh, sexual intercourse. So the process is a little weird. So it start for starters, you have to be sexually mature, which is not uncommon. And in worms, it takes about a year to be sexually mature. Uh, how do you recognize if a worm is sexually mature? Uh, since they don't have external genitalia to, to to obviously to recognize maturity, like in humans, you look at the clotilium or that band close to the mouth. Uh, if it seems to be uh, either uh, darker in color or full, then it's best to re be recognized that this is a sexually mature worm. So again, the environmental cues, warm rain in the spring, ground is soft, warm and moist, uh, and then it gets a little freaky here. So the worms are going to attach mouth to anus and anus to mouth, and they're going to copulate uh, which basically means exchange um, sperm in a two-hour process called sliming. So again, a very long uh, energy draining process. Uh, the sperm received then travels to the other seminal receptacles and is stored there. Okay. Mature eggs are released from somite 13. And then the clotilium then secretes a tube of mucus which slips over the front of the worm. So essentially the, the clotilium is making a mucousy tube or cocoon. And that clotilium is then going to, that mucus tube is going to begin to move forward anteriorly toward the head. And as it's moving toward the head, it's going to be picking up and receiving the eggs from segment 14. And as it passes somite numbers 9 and 10, the worm is going to release the sperm that it received in its seminal receptacles and put it inside that cocoon. So fertilization actually occurs inside the tube outside the worm. Okay, so like I said that again. So fertilization, the sperm and the egg meeting occurs inside the mucousy tube from the clotilium, but does not incur, does not incur inside the worm itself. So that tube is then sealed, left to burrow there to form a cocoon, Contain now several fertilized eggs called, again, called zygotes, and we're going to get a lot of wormlets that are going to be uh, uh, burrow out of the cocoon several weeks to months later, depending again on the uh, environmental temperature. So after three to four weeks, these little wormlets will crawl out. If moisture temperature are not right, those, these guys can stay in here up to a year or more, which is just crazy to think about energy conservation and how the uh, environment plays an impact on genetics and vice versa. So the adult worms do not stay with the cocoon, but they'll crawl off. So again, a um, K strategist in ecology terms, right, where we're going to throw a whole lot of eggs, a whole lot of meat on the table, where even if, you know, a football team of people come into a Chinese buffet, there's still going to be food left. So in essence, we're going to just throw lots and lots of eggs and, and little wormlets out there and the odds of that at least one of them will make it to adulthood, and if by by that, then we have increased fitness. So again, here's just a um, artistic representation of the reproductive process. So kind of walk you through here. So again, here's one worm with the clotilium, which means the mouth is here. Here's the other worm with the mouth close to this one's anus, right, and the clotilium. So the sperm is going to travel from the seminal vesicles down through the sperm duct around uh, somite number 14, and it's going to pass its sperm into the other seminal receptacles. And likewise for this worm, so sperm is gonna travel, gonna travel down this tube and travel into this one's seminal receptacles. The clotilium is then going to make this mucousy tube, and it's going to slime up and travel, start to travel, this way, kind of think of like shedding there of snake skins. As it travels, it's going to pick up the, both the eggs, 
right? Both the eggs. Let's do this one because it's easier. Both sections are drawn. So it's going to travel this way, and as it travels, it's going to pick up the eggs from the ovaries as well as the other worm sperm, and then travel off the mouth. Okay. And then finally, like I said, there we have nice little fertilized eggs, and little wormlets can uh, come out based off environmental cues. So let's watch this video here of worm reproduction, and see where we're going. All right. Earthworms are hermaphroditic. Each earthworm possesses both testes producing sperm and ovaries producing ova. When two earthworms mate, they align in opposite directions. The testes produce sperm which pass from seminal vesicles through male genital pores, which are small openings in the 15th segment of the body. Sperm then travel to seminal receptacles, which are part of the female reproductive system, which store sperm and are located between segments 9 and 10 and 10 and 11. After mating, the clitellum produces mucus, a mucus cocoon, which travels along the width of the body and will obtain unfertilized eggs as this mucus cocoon passes the female genital pores in segment 14. And then as the cocoon passes the openings for the seminal uh, receptacles in segments 9 and 10 and 10 and 11, uh, the sperm will fertilize the ova. In terrestrial annelids, there is no larval stage. The eggs hatch as miniature adults. All right. So, a neat, neat little video there. Uh, let's get this. Yeah, neat little video there uh, showing the reproduction of the worm. So, again, you can pause here, watch that video a few times, uh, but again, the, the pathway um, and, the site and the strategies of worm reproduction uh, will be definitely be a good short answer type question there. All right, so uh, when we do get to do dissections, hopefully fairly soon, uh, again, just some dissection protocols report any energy injury, obviously. Uh, again, please clean up. In any materials and dissecting materials and tools with soap and wipe down your desk. Again, throw away any specimens, and then the most important thing is have fun and try to identify as many parts as possible. So, here is your working model of a earthworm dissection. You can pause here to see how many parts you can name. And in the next couple of slides, I've got a couple of different artistic views of earthworms so that you can see that. Uh, one of the two uh, slides down below will be used for your quiz, uh, which you'll be asked to label the parts of the worm, as well as the pathway of digestion. So again, I uh, hope you enjoyed this video. Hopefully you found it fairly useful. And if you have any questions, feel free to contact me. And... Thank you very much, guys.